As we pray together this morning, a couple of requests that we would share with you. Um, first of all, Miss Sylvia Morris. I don't know if you got the message last night, but Miss Sylvia fell this week and broke her leg and uh, is going to be going to do some rehab and those kind of things. Sylvia's had a really tough time the last few years, so do keep Sylvia in your prayers. Um, also, Miss Kay Soulsby. Uh, Kay lost her sister, Kay um, Faye, this week and uh, was married yesterday. She is uh, uh, going to have a hard time filling that void, so keep uh, Kay in your prayers today. So, if you will, let's pray together. Father, this morning we thank you for the privilege of gathering in your name and knowing that you are already here, that you're ready to meet the needs that we have. Uh, we'd ask you, Lord, this morning that you would just fill this place with your spirit. Uh, we pray for the, a fresh anointing that it would fall as we sing together, as we read your word, that, Lord, we'll be touched and our lives will be transformed. We brought burdens, we brought needs with us today, and we need to know that we can bring those to your feet and know that you hear and you will answer every prayer. So bring peace to our hearts, give courage to our spirits and our souls, and Lord, give feet to our faith today. May we carry this wonderful story of Jesus to a lost and dying world, and Lord, may you be blessed by our time together, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. It's good to see you this morning. Uh, we are we're growing a little. Uh, that's a good thing. We have been uh, a little on the lower elm for a little while now. So hopefully, as this pandemic kind of fades away, and hopefully that is what's happening, we'll be able to to worship together a little more effectively. And uh, for those of you that are listening at home, we're glad that you're there, but we miss you here. So we look forward to when we all be together again. If you are visiting with us here in the the sanctuary this morning, we're glad that you're here. We'd like to know who you are. Uh, maybe have a record that you came to be with us today. So if this is your first visit or you haven't been for a while, if you would fill out the back of your bulletin this morning, there's a visitor's card there. We'd be uh, honored to know who you are and be able to send you a word of welcome and greeting from our office and from our church staff. Uh, just a few announcements for you. Uh, first of all, the flower here on my right, it is to commemorate the newest arrival in our family and community. Um, Sloan Stower was born this week, born to uh, John and Charlie uh, you may know Charlie as Charlie Pickens, but she's been a store for a while now, so we celebrate with them. Uh, uh, they are doing pretty well, and we encourage you to keep them in prayer. They do ask, at least at this moment, because of the things that are going on, that you not visit for a little while, give them time to settle in and those kind of things, but uh, do keep them in prayer. Uh, a couple of other announcements. Uh, we are scheduled this morning by our bylaws to vote on our new officers and teachers for the coming year. Uh, with this pandemic, it has been really difficult to get in touch with people, to see people and ask about those positions. So uh, we will not be presenting that this morning. That will be presented as quickly as possible uh, as soon as all the information is here. So we'll be letting you know more about that as quickly as we can. Um, tomorrow, uh, the youth are going to a, a day camp over to Crowder's Ridge. Hopefully you have all of your paperwork in hand and everything is filled out, ready to go. Uh, what time are you leaving? leaving 7.30, so uh, get up early and uh, come be a part of that as well. Uh, we've been announcing for several weeks that we are planning an outing to Otter Park, the, the water park. Uh, that will, uh, will take place in a couple of weeks. Uh, we're trying to get an accurate number, so if you know for sure your family is going to come or if you think you're going to come, if you would either sign up, there's a sheet by the church office, or if you would call, let us know, or you can even uh, email the church, whatever you need to do, let us know how many are planning to go. Uh, we think that that's going to be a go now, but we would like to know a little more definitely how many people are coming. Uh, for those of you with children in this auditorium this morning, if you didn't pick one of these up, send your kids out to the front vestibule. Uh, this is sort of a little guide that Pam has put together to help them with our worship experience today. It's, uh, there's some crayons and some things that are out there that will help uh, it, them keep up with the service and maybe take part. Uh, hopefully it helps just keep an idea of what we're doing and helps them be a part of our worship experience as well. Uh, one final thing, uh, we are relying heavily during this pandemic on our Realm program. It is the software our church uses for all of our upkeep, for our book work and everything else. Uh, some of you may not be familiar with what that is or how it works or what do you do or how do I do online giving or how do I get the messages and how do I send messages. If you're interested in learning about that, I asked Pam this morning, uh, she's going to be doing a tutorial. It will be on Facebook uh, where you can watch and she'll guide you step by step. This is where the program is. This is how you sign on. This is what you can do. This is where you sign up to give online. This is how you can get other information from the church. So if you're interested in that, look for that sometime this week. Not sure exactly. 
probably will be after Tuesday before it's done, but just want to try to give you a little information about what we're doing, where we are, how you can more able and freely access the information that we have as a church family, and we can contact you as well, so keep that in mind. Again, we're glad you're here. We look forward to a great day. Uh, Pray that God will move in a mighty way this morning as we worship and share together.
Is there any doubt this morning that God is moving? We had a 5.2 Richter scale earthquake this morning. Everything is moving. I thought it was just because we were in deacons meeting, but apparently other things besides the deacons are moving today. If you have your Bible, I invite you to read with me from the book of Genesis again this morning, the 28th chapter. We're going to begin our reading in the 10th verse, so we invite you to read along with us as we share together. Genesis 28, verse 10. Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head. And he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed. And behold, a ladder was set up on earth, and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I've spoken to you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. Reading this story this week, I was reminded of an event from my childhood. My dad always did family devotions with us when we were children, and uh, sometimes he would read us Bible stories, and sometimes he would tell us Bible stories. And that was always the last thing we did before we went to bed at night. And uh, being young and a little impetuous, We never wanted to go to bed, so he would finish the story, and my brother and sister and I would look at each other, and we'd always say the same thing. And then what? What happened then? And I'm not sure it was that we so much wanted to know what the next part of the story was. It was just a way to keep us awake. But I began thinking about, after the message last week, about how important it is to make wise choices and how there are always consequences to the choices that we make. What happened after this experience that Jacob and Esau share? What takes place in their life? What do they do? Where does the story go from there? Well, we'll try to pick it up very quickly and move us ahead to where the message will start this morning, but a few years pass and Jacob is getting older. Jacob has... Uh, gotten a little more experience and a little more understanding about some of the things that are going on in his life. And in this whole process, his father Isaac is nearing death. Isaac is blind. And Isaac calls in the oldest son, Esau, and he said, Son, I'm, I'm close to death. It's time for me to give you my birthright. I want you, before I give you the birthright, to go out and, and kill some game and bring it in and make me some stew, and let me eat the stew, and then I'll give to you the birthright, the blessing that is rightfully yours. Esau goes out to hunt. While Esau is out hunting, Rebekah has overheard the conversation between Isaac and Esau. And she decides, we got to do something about this because, Jacob, you're supposed to get the blessing. You're supposed to be the leader. In fact, Your brother gave you the birthright anyway, and so she comes up with this very interesting plan. She said, here's what we'll do. I'll kill a couple of goats. We'll make a stew for that. We'll feed it to your father. We will dress you in your brother's clothing, and from the skin of those goats, we will cover your hands and your arms. We'll cover your neck, and we will send you in with this bowl of food, and you will pretend to be your brother. Well, it happens just like they planned problem is that when Jacob gets inside, 
Dad is a little suspicious. Something doesn't seem quite right. And he says, you know, you, you sound like Isaac. Or you sound like, like Jacob. You smell like Esau. You feel like Esau. But you sound like the younger brother. Jacob assures him that, no, I I am your oldest. I am the one to receive the birthright. And so being blind, Esau receives exactly what he had bargained for. The blessing goes to his younger brother. and, And when he comes home and finds out what has happened, Esau is furious. Back in chapter 27, in verse 41, it says, So Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing which his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Jacob decides now, you know, this would be the perfect time for me to go to Uncle Laban's and find a wife. And so he sets out on this journey back to his homeland looking for a wife. And at the end of his first day's journey, he's tired from the journey thus far. And so he finds a place out in the desert and he sets up his camp. He chooses a stone for a pillow. I don't understand that. If I'm going to have a pillow, I want something that kind of revolves around and sinks into my head where it doesn't feel like it's a rock. But he sets up this stone, lays down, goes to sleep. And while he sleeps, he has a dream. In the dream, there is a a stairway that reaches from earth to heaven. And there are angels that are going up and down the stairway. And at the very top of the stairway itself is God. And God speaks to him. And in verse 13 through 15 from our text this morning, he just kind of reiterates the promise that he made to Abraham and the promise that he made to Isaac. And he says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you this land. Your descendants are going to be great. Through you, all the peoples of the world are going to be blessed. It's kind of a new thing for Jacob. And now it's Jacob's turn to decide whether he believes the promise and the word of God or not. Jacob wakes up from the dream, and and he says in verse 16, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't know it. And he begins to make some changes and some choices in his life. Things that will define who he becomes in the days that lay before him. I wonder... What happened to him that night? It's the same thing that I am praying happens to everyone here in this room and everybody that may listen to this message via the internet or however you're receiving the message. We could call it starting over. And there are three elements to the story that each of us need to experience for ourselves because they make up the how-to of starting again. What needs to happen? To you and to me. Number one, that night, God became personal. You see, Jacob grew up in a home knowing about God. He he knew about Abraham's faith. He knew about Isaac's faith. He knew that the people that he lived with were not like the Canaanites. They had numerous gods. The Israelites only had one God. They didn't look the same. They didn't act the same. But up until this moment in Jacob's life, it seems like he kind of kept religion at an arm's distance. He knew about it. He respected it. He revered it. But it really wasn't personal. You see, when you read the story of his life, you don't get any indication that he is trusting God. He doesn't really seem to bear any kind of evidence in his life that he knows what God had promised and he believes that God is going to do that. In fact, when you read the story, there's not one prayer that Isaac off- or that, that Jacob offers. There's not one act of faith that Jacob experiences. True to his name throughout his life to this moment, he is a deceiver. He is a schemer. He is a planter. 
He, he is a, a, an individual that will do whatever he has to do to get his own way. Even if he has to lie to his dad, doesn't matter. As long as I get what I want, I'm going to do what I need to do. But now he is in the desert alone facing this moment of truth. The God of all creation has come to him and he says, I'm your grandfather's God. I'm your father's God. And whether you know it or not, I am your God. And the promises that I made then, I will make to you. I will fulfill them in your life. And at that moment, his father's religion became real to him. It became personal. That's what needs to happen in our lives. There needs to be a moment when religion itself moves from general to specific. Where it moves from being theoretical to being practical. From something that is historical to something that is personal. Where we say, this is my experience now. This is not just about the God that I grew up with and the God that I've heard about and the God that people have talked about and the God that I've read about in the Bible. He is my God. He watches over me. He made promises to me that are real. And that all begins when you ask the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Lord and your personal Savior. You give Him your heart. You give Him your life. You begin that new relationship. But folks, it doesn't end there. Because I'm also talking about a point where you promise, God, I will trust you beginning today, every day of my life. I believe that you will do exactly what you said. Kind of like the promises he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What were those promises? I will be with you today. Wherever you go, I will be with you. I will give you strength to face Whatever you have to face. I will give you peace and I will be your joy. I'll fill your life with meaning. I'll cause everything that happens to work together for good in your life. I will hear your prayers. I will cover your past with mercy. So often we go through life thinking that the promises that God made, he meant for other people. For good people, not people like me. God was talking about those other people, those evangelists and those missionaries and those Sunday school teachers and those choir members and those kindergarten workers, but not the people like me. God promised good people good stuff. Remember, God made these promises to a gentleman that was a liar, a schemer, A deceiver? Starting over simply means that you make your relationship with God a personal matter. He is not just a historical God. He is a very present God. A personal God. Not just the God that your parents taught you about. He is the God that came and sent his son to die for you individually, particularly. It's a personal matter. Secondly, the second step in his journey, he realized, you know, God is everywhere. When Jacob laid down that night to go to bed, he he laid down in a campsite in the middle of the desert, and it was nothing more than that. It's sand and wind and sun and stars, and maybe the moon is shining. He sleeps all night undisturbed, and when he wakes up the next morning, something has changed. God is here. God is in this place. God is here with me right now. And then he goes through the ritual of pouring oil on the rock that he used for a pillow, and he changes the name of the place to Bethel, which means the house of God. What is the purpose of the oil? Oil is used for healing. It's used for anointing. It's used for making things special. You ever read in in the the 23rd Psalm and wonder what in the world that's all about where the psalmist said that God anoints my head with oil? What is that about? It has two meanings. 
it was a sign of blessing that you are receiving the blessings of God, the guidance and the protection of God. But in, in a sheep's stance of life, it means this. When there was a wound, when there was an injury, when flies were tormenting that animal and, and the wound wouldn't heal, the shepherd would take oil and pour the oil over the wound to make sure that the wound healed and that the individual wouldn't be tormented. And folks, that to me is one of the greatest promises of God, that all of the hurts that I have in life and the wounds that I have and the injuries and the things that just won't seem to heal, the Spirit of God will heal you. God will touch your life and give you the strength to move beyond that hurt, that wound, and let you move to the next phase of life. You remember the story in Exodus chapter 3, verse 5, when God appeared to Moses? First thing he said to him was this. Take off your shoes. The place where you stand is holy ground. What made that spot holy? Surely it wasn't Moses. Nothing to do with it being desert. It wasn't a, a very special place per se. What makes the spot holy is that God was there. Where is God today? What was his promise? I will never leave you or forsake you. Wherever you are, God is. Wherever God is, is holy ground. So everywhere that you go, understand the fact that God is there with you and it is a holy place because God is the God of this moment, of your life, of right now. I hear people say all the time, well, you know, sometimes I try to pray and it feels like my prayers don't get any higher than the ceiling. You ever felt that? Let me give you some good news. Your prayer doesn't have to get any higher than the ceiling. Because where you stand is holy ground, as God is already there. And when you don't feel like your prayer has been heard, God heard your prayer before you ever voiced it. He knew your need, He knew your life, He knew your heart, He knew your mind, He knew your concern, He knew your frustration. Every step of your life, every place that you go is holy. Because God goes with you. The moment we are aware of that, that surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Folks, that is life-changing. Wherever you go, God is there with you. The third step of Jacob's experience is this. Jacob commits himself to follow the Lord. He was not content to just have an experience. To just feel moved, to, to be able to walk out of that moment in his life and say, boy, that was awesome. You ever have a church service like that or an event in your life where you leave and you think, man, God showed up today. God did something today. I really felt the power of God or I really felt something happen in my life. Jacob didn't want just an experience. Didn't want this to be just a special moment he looked back onto in his life. He was ready to make a long-term, life-changing decision. And here's what he decided, beginning in verse 20, the same chapter we read from. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and keep me in this way that I'm going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. Now, don't misunderstand that verse. It kind of sounds like he's scheming again. Well, God, if you'll do this, I'll do that. And we do that all the time in our life, but that's not what Jacob is doing. Jacob is repeating the words that God has said, and he said, God, if you're going to do this, I promise you, I will do this. I will commit my life to you. I will live for you. It'll not just be this one moment in my life that I look back on. It will be from now on a lifelong commitment. Not only that, but down in verse 22, he goes on to say, And this stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, 
I will surely give you a tenth. God, this is not just one of those feel-good moments. This has changed the course of my life. And the man that was so interested in how much I'm going to get and getting more than everybody else realizes, God, it's not about what you get that really matters. It's what you give. And from this day forward, I'll give you a tenth of everything that you bless me with. I surrender my life. I mean business. Jacob is repenting in his life and making God first and making God priority. Every person in this room today needs to have an experience like that. A moment of surrender when you really give your life to Jesus. A moment when you say, God, I'm not playing games. I mean business. A moment when you say, God, I, I'm really going to trust you with everything. I'm, I'm ready to back it up with all that I have and all that I am. You know, I wonder this morning if, if we could go back in your life for just a moment to that time when you prayed to ask Jesus Christ to be your Savior. Do you remember the moment? Remember where you were? Remember how it felt? Where would you begin if I were to ask you now? This is what happened. This is the day you gave your life to Christ. And then what? What have you done since? How has it changed who you are? How has it changed what you've done? How has it changed how you live? How you treat others? Oddly enough, when we read the rest of the story of Jacob's life, you'll discover that he still isn't perfect. He still makes a lot of mistakes, makes some foolish choices. But what you see in the thread of his life is after this moment, he is different. God is doing a work in his life that will continue for the rest of his life. And just like us, Folks, God is working in us, and God is working on us. He didn't make us perfect overnight. Well, not all of us. You know, some of us are pretty close to perfect. But God promised us in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, He who began a good work in you is faithful to complete that. See, I believe this morning that a lot of us, like Jacob, need to start over. And it begins the moment you make it personal. That you understand that God sees, God knows everything there is to know about you. And he knows whether or not you really have made a commitment to follow him or not. There have been some moments in my life that I've really thought, boy, I'd like to go back to my conversion experience. I'd like to feel what I felt then. And the only problem with that is, folks, that life is not just about your feelings. It's about your faith. It's about a faith that holds on to God when you don't feel anything. It's about a faith that holds on to God when you feel Angry. That God has failed you and God has let you down and that God isn't there and that God isn't answering your prayer and all the things that you can think of in life that are negative and bad that have happened to you. Where has God been? The answer is God has always been there. And God always will be there. It's the promise he made. Maybe you just need to start over. Because you can't go back and change anything about yesterday. You really don't know what you're going to have to do tomorrow. But maybe you know exactly what you need to do right now. 
God, I had forgotten that wherever you are is holy. Forgotten that you were always with me. Forgotten that even in a pandemic, you're still God. And God, I want this commitment that I make to you to be real, life-changing. And not just for today, but from now on. Starting over. It's one of those choices that you have to make. Pray with me. Father, today we are thankful that you give us the opportunity to begin again. And not just once, but over and over and over. There are some days that we seem to try to understand it. We, we get it right or pretty much right and we feel good about what we've done and who we are. And there are other days, Lord, that we feel like such miserable failures that our life really hasn't amounted to much and we've not been as faithful as we could have or should have been. And I pray, Lord, this morning that what we feel in our lives is not just the, the joy of the success or the, the anguish over the failure, but we feel the understanding that, God, you are God in every situation, every day of our lives. You love us when we succeed and you love us when we fail. And you constantly call us to never settle, to never be content with where we are, but to day by day take steps to becoming more and more like you. Some of us who hear this message today may have just simply given up. It's been difficult and life has not really worked out like we thought. And Lord, we need a new start. Some of us have failed miserably in our faith and we've not really been living the way that our lives should be and we understand the call of God is to live holy and righteous, to be separate from the world, and but we need a new start. And Lord, there's some of us that sit on a church pew every Sunday morning. And we smile with a holy and godly smile. But in the depth of our heart, we feel like we need to start again because there's something missing. There's something that we're not doing, something that we are doing that we don't feel is right for the call of God upon us. We need to start over. And so as we sing this commitment hymn this morning and as we listen and feel the tug of your spirit as you speak to us, Lord, give us courage today. Courage to make a commitment. Courage to make a new start. Courage to be honest. And God, make us new today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing our commitment hymn this morning, we're going to encourage you, if God has spoken, maybe there is a decision that you need to make. Maybe you're here and you are not a believer. You need to start at the very beginning. Today, would you come? Let us show you how you can have that new life. It's not the religion of your father. It's not just about being a Baptist. It's about being a child of God, having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe God brought you here and you've been looking for a church home. We'd like to open our doors and invite you to come and join us here at Mount Lebanon. Maybe you sit on our church pew every week. But there's something in your heart, something in your life, something in your mind that day after day stands between you and what God wants you to be and to do. We invite you today to lay that at the altar this morning and start over. And let God be Lord of all of your life. And so as he speaks to you this morning, if you would desire to come, we invite you. While we stand and sing, you do as God leads you today. Let's stand together.
just realized I failed to mention if you brought your offering this morning or if you filled out a visitor's card, there's some buckets on the front here and some at the back. Don't go back out with those things in your pocket. Leave them for us, and we do appreciate your faithfulness together. Let's pray as we are dismissed. Father, we thank you this morning for the privilege of gathering together and for these that are here. I pray, Lord, that you will take the words that we have heard this morning and help us to live them day after day. May our faith be visible. May it be holy. But most importantly, God, may it help bring others to a relationship with you. Go with us as we leave this place now. Use this for your glory, I pray in Jesus' name.